Well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to present. Um, I, I did give uh, a very closely related talk earlier for those of you who were at Strata, although uh, now I think let's go into a bit more of the engineering on this and a bit more of the transformation of, of how we got here and what we're trying to do. Um, I, uh, I had been involved with Spark, I'd been the evangelist for Spark before and uh, prior to that for Mesos and uh, before that I'd I'd led data teams in industry uh, for uh, about 10 years or so. Um, along, along the way, uh, one of my teams was doing some natural language processing, and uh, we got approached by friends up in, a in uh, Seattle to try out a new thing, and we became one of the first uh, teams to be using uh, something that's now called AWS. And so I, I had the privilege of being one of the first few people outside of Amazon to do 100% cloud architecture. And then while we were working on that project, we, we ran into some bottlenecks, and one of our young engineers, who's now CEO of Mesosphere, um, he, uh, he brought up this new open source project that we should try to use in the cloud. It was something called Hadoop. So this was late in 2006. And, uh, and then we ended up having some problems with that, and we wanted to run it more efficiently on, on EC2, so we pulled down a Jira ticket and ended up creating something that was uh, uh, later a case study for Elastic MapReduce. So I, I got to see a lot of interesting things in industry in terms of big data. Got to work on a lot of those projects and then an opportunity came uh, to join O'Reilly. And O'Reilly is not a technology company. Um, you know, we've been around communities of technology since day one. I don't know if you know the origin story for O'Reilly, but um, Tim and Dale were hanging around Unix user groups back around Harvard uh, in, the, in the 80s, and they thought the documentation was pretty bad for Unix. So they, they started writing better. And um, we've, we've done a lot with technology conferences and technology publishing, but we're not a technology firm. Um, so about two years ago, Andrew Odewan, uh, who's a CTO for O'Reilly, uh, he was looking at Docker, he was looking at Spark, he was looking at Hadoop, at Mesos, a lot of these kinds of technologies, and realizing that we were gonna have to get busy to transform ourselves, uh, to become a technology company, to become much more specialized in big data, in analytics, in data science, and, uh, and so that's about the time when I jumped in. Um, and so part of, the, part of the glue for all this is, uh, since we're a publisher, is something called Project Jupiter. How many people have used Jupiter? Okay, good. So 25% or so. Um, and if you haven't heard of it before, this is an evolution of uh, what had previously been called IPython notebooks. Fernando Perez had created this. Fernando, Fernando jokes around and says that he used this to uh, be able to uh, delay getting his dissertation done. Um, he's a physicist. He's now at, at uh, uh, Lawrence Berkeley. Um, there's a, a lot more than Python, uh, notwithstanding the name. Uh, if you look at this here, let me see if we're, am I? Yeah, I'm on, okay. Uh, if you haven't used this, there's 50 plus different environments, different kinds of, of programming environments that you could use with Jupyter. So it's not just Python. Uh, you know, it has support for uh, Python 2.3 by default. <clears throat> and then JavaScript, Ruby, Haskell, Clojure, Scala, pretty much anything that has a REPL can be wrapped up into the protocols for as a Jupyter kernel and then subsequently have some kind of Jupyter notebook. Um, I've got some notes here. If you want to install it, there's a little bit of a, a, uh, an example that I can go through. Um, I'll probably dig more into the engineering as opposed to this part here, but it, I'll have the slides up if you want to try it. Um, I definitely recommend uh, using Anaconda is one good way. You can use PIP or other ways as well, but uh, Anaconda has the distribution on this very nicely. And so here's a sample application, a little bit of NLP. I've got a um, couple of paragraphs of text, and then I've got uh, a really great Python project called TextBlob. It has a very high performance uh, statistical parsers in it, as well as uh, name entity recognition and noun phrase chunking, a lot of good things that you would want for an NLP. So I showed how to do a couple of these here, uh, basically convert the text, parse it, 
uh, you get a blob object out, and uh, then we'll print some of the uh, part of speech tags, print the noun phrases, typical things when you're doing NLP. Now to represent that as a Jupyter Notebook, uh, you know, here we've got, uh, you can see it's broken into a few different cells. So we start out, we've got some text, some hypertext, that's a markdown cell. So you've got some kind of data in there uh, that's being rendered as, as hypertext. And then next you've got text equals and then a couple of paragraphs, so you've got some data. And then next we call in a library, we call in some code, uh, so that's a code block. And then next we've got another cell that executes and prints out some kind of result. So that's the notion of a notebook, is this linear arrangement of cells that can be marked down, that can be code, that can be output, uh, and you can build a narrative out of that. Um, now, the thing about Jupyter, what I'm getting toward is uh, we treat it as middleware. That was the original idea when you talk to Fernando about it. Um, the idea is that HTTP is really capturing the remote semantics of file share. Right? You can get, you can put, you can delete, but you're sharing files over a network. And HTTP is a, a network pr protocol for capturing those semantics. Jupyter is the network protocol, uh, the semantics for a REPL, a read, uh, eval, print loop. And so the idea is that you can do remote execution on some type of REPL. Uh, so for instance, at, when I was at Databricks, Databricks Cloud using notebooks, uh, the idea is that uh, Scala, uh, Spar uh, excuse me, Scala, Python, R, et cetera, these languages that were interfacing Apache Spark, um, these are effectively REPLs. And even though there's a cluster behind it, you know, you're interacting with a REPL and then you can have a notebook as something capturing your, your application. Uh, so there's a great team behind it. There's a lot of great projects. Jupyter Lab is the new thing that's coming up. It's more of an IDE. There's Jupyter Hub that's more distributed, used in universities a lot. Um, and there's an event coming up. There's a worldwide conference called uh, JupyterCon that O'Reilly's helping to put together. But the reason we're doing this is because we're a publisher and we recognize that publishing changed. Um, so. When we talk about data science, you probably hear the term story, da, excuse me, data visualization, data storytelling, uh, storytelling. You hear this, these terms used a lot to describe how to interpret the insights that are produced out of analyzing data. But yet, when we talk about storytelling in general, we, we could talk about books, we could talk about movies, a lot of different applications of media that are much richer than just the sort of plots that we tend to get when we do data analytics. Uh, and that was something that we were very concerned about at O'Reilly, is how do we get to something that's richer? So when you think about publishing online, it's usually HTML or video. Most of what you publish online is that. And we're interested in how can we push this further? How can we publish something more interactive? Uh, so there's a, a few different uh, uh, articles here that go into this in more detail. In particular, Andrew Odewan and uh, Tim O'Reilly <clears throat> uh, joined in on some of this here. Uh, it's uh, examining what we're trying to do with Jupyter, Docker, and along with that, Mesos and others. Um, and the long and short of it is this. When you come to a conference like Strata and you go to a tutorial, on whatever topic, it might be a three-hour tutorial, you, uh, you might get a, 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 vagrant on a, a vagrant file on a USB stick as a way to put together the, the code that you need for the tutorial, or you might spend 20, 30, 40 minutes installing software just before the tutorial gets going. How many people have had that? I, I, that never happened. It usually goes for like 30 or 40 minutes into the tutorial. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, I mean, you lose so, that part. Yeah, yeah. Like 15 minutes, like, okay, uh, yeah. So that, that's our core business, and we were like, this is messed up. How can we fix this? Because the Wi-Fi is pretty bad. Um, we thought about bringing in a big box full of processors and just setting up our own little cloud right there on the stage, and we actually built cabinets for that. Um, but what we realized was we could do something better, and right about that time is when Docker started getting popular. So we wanted to figure out how to put together Docker 
and with it, the infrastructure behind that uh, for a new kind of media. And uh, so it's probably better to show than to tell. Um, here is Peter Norvig, who's head of research at Google. He, uh, he did the first one of these, and uh, it was a real pleasure working with Peter because he also he knows a lot about uh, education, um, definitely internally in, in uh, Google. Uh, he's led search and AI there, uh, but also with Udacity and others. He, he has a thing or two about, about education. Um, so I'll, I'll bring up a tutorial that he did. And this is in a service that we have called Safari. I don't know if you know, but almost all of the content for O'Reilly is moving into a membership platform called Safari. And uh, so here's some tutorials. Here's uh, Peter Norvig. I don't know if I'll get sound out of this, but you can try it. Um, so Peter had a Jupyter notebook called Regex Golf. Because uh, anybody here ever read a comic called XKCD? OK. Um, so Peter was uh, introducing Randall at, who does XKCD, he was interest, introducing uh, Randall Monroe at a conference, and Randall got up there and started talking about this kind of programming context, how to, uh, how to optimize regex to get the smallest possible one uh, for a, a given data set. And uh, Peter listened to this, and he was like, no, that's wrong, that's wrong, you, meant, you didn't do this right. So he wanted to go and fix it, and he created this notebook to describe basically a programming contest of how to get the smallest regex that would give you coverage across a particular data problem. Uh, so what we've got here is Peter on camera for about 20 minutes uh, talking about this and really giving you the big picture of what he's trying to do with this programming challenge. And alongside that, though, you've got the, uh, the hypertext, if you will, the rich media uh, with links that you know, dive deeper. Uh, but you've also got the code. And so we can run the code, and, uh, and, and basically the way this is set up, uh, the, the text and the code can sync to the video, and the video can sync to the text and the code. You can use one to drive the other. Uh, so here, um, okay, I'm just going to click a few of these, and you can see that as I'm running the code, I get some output from that. And, uh, but the whole time, I could just be running Peter, or I could scoot through to a different part and say skip to here and have uh, Peter pick up from there. Um, the other thing about this is that I can come in and change the code. So instead of printing out that, I could come in and say uh, print, gosh, I'm gonna, I think that Peter was doing uh, Python 2.7 on this. So let's see if I get an error or not. If not, I'll fix it. I did, okay. I converted this to Python 3. Um, run it again. I can change the code and rerun it. So the idea with this kind of media is it's purely HTML, but everybody who sets up a web page, HTML, a, a session, also we spin up a Docker container in the cloud. And that's your private sandbox. And that Docker container has all the, the Jupyter resources, the kernel, as well as the code, the library that you need to run, any data that you need. It's all containerized there. So everybody has their own private instance of this running in the cloud. And so, okay, that, that speaks to the problem of walking into a tutorial and instead of spending 40 minutes setting things up, boom, you just go to a web page and you're going. But it also means that you can follow along with somebody like Peter and, uh, and look at the code that he's saying and you can go in and, and change the code, play what ifs, see if you can beat him. And that's actually the point of this tutorial is Peter is basically throwing down the gauntlet and saying, look, this is the best I could get out of these regex definitions, but see if you can beat me. Um, so it's, it's very much a hands-on way of working with code at the same time hearing the thoughts of the expert who put it together. And, uh, and that's the idea of computable code in a nutshell is how can we bring together these components of code, data, text, video, all into a kind of narrated experience that you get to have hands-on and try it. And, uh, and, and what we found when we started launching this, we're still experimenting and trying different forms, but we found that, number one, our engagement metrics jumped by an order of magnitude. Uh, and that, as a publisher, that's very important. That's what you're, you're trying to go for. Um, what we also found, though, when we started talking is that you know, if you're in academia, if you're a university professor and you have to publish or perish, uh, 
we're finding that the economics of publishing books is just falling out, right? Books really don't bring in money unless you're a bestseller. And so if you're an assistant professor that's tenure tracked and you're trying to make money by doing a textbook, good luck. Um, it doesn't really work that well these days. Um, but we, what we do find is that these same people are taking and building up materials, learning materials, in Jupyter Notebooks. And if you go to GitHub, there's over 300,000 of these that are published, uh, or, or public Jupyter Notebooks, of course. They're not all by professors, but a lot of them are. A lot of what's out there right now is coming from the sciences. And so, for instance, when uh, the, the LIGO work was published, when the Gravity Waves work was published, it was published as a Jupyter Notebook. Um, so the reason why we did this was, again, about big data. Uh, and, and we saw a challenge that we had to try to solve. Part of it was from the audience and part of it was from the authors. Uh, the audience needs to be able to get hands-on uh, very quickly with materials and be able to run code uh, as opposed to having code in a GitHub repo and a book over here. Now you have it all together. Um, the other part of it is that we really do practice peer teaching. That's been O'Reilly since day one. And we have a lot of great authors, and a lot of great instructors who are out in industry, uh, who are, are practicing, who are leading uh, open source projects, they're tech leads, et cetera. They're busy people. So when we create a book, it's usually about a six to nine month project. At, at some other publishers I've been at, it's more like a two year project. Uh, when we create a video, video also takes months. And in particular, a six hour video probably takes about eight times that amount of time to prepare it. You probably take some time off work to fly to the studio, you spend a week in the studio, you fly back, and then you spend another couple weeks doing post-processing. You're taking three weeks off work to create a video. And we find that people just don't have that much time anymore. And also we find that, that the rate of change for technology is increasing, so we can't wait six months to cover a new topic. We wanted to decrease the time to market. And by using Jupyter, by using Docker, by using Mesos, we're able to cut that time down from six months to about three weeks. So now we can get a new substantial tutorial out again within weeks. And so the architecture is this. At the base level, it's cloud. We started out uh, building this on two different clouds, and now we're building on two others. Um, and the part where our software comes together is that we built an architecture at the, the cluster layer, which is primarily Mesos, but then Marathon on top of that. How many people have worked with Mesos? Okay. How many people have worked with Marathon? A couple. Okay, good. So basically, uh, Mesos is your, your resources for your cluster, and then Marathon would be like an init D. Um, it's basically how are you starting your services, how are you having your services running. And for us, the services we needed to have were guarantees that some number of these Docker instances were running. So for each different product, there might be a different Docker instance. And Marathon does that kind of service scheduling, service provisioning. Um, we also had to have statefulness, so we built an application gateway, also a security gateway, uh, based off of Redis and Nginx. So that, that provided, the other parts of it are, you know, Docker and Marathon are relatively talking about immutable infrastructure, whereas Nginx and Redis are more the statefulness. And that's all on the server backend. In the middleware, we have Jupyter. So again, Jupyter is a suite of network protocols that give you the remote semantics of REPL. Um, and so we use it as middleware. And then we put something on top of that called Thebe. It's an open source project. It's, it's on GitHub if you want to check it out. Basically, you can take what is published in Jupyter and project it out as HTML. So it's like, a, a, it's like an HTML player for YouTube where you have a, a little fraction of HTML that you embed somewhere. A very similar thing with Thebe. Um, and then the last mile is where people interact with this, and that's you know, it's, it's web component, well, it's moving to web components. We started doing this before, really, we were going to take a bet on web components quite yet. But it's HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and now we're, we're moving in more React as well. Um, we also use an open source uh, video player called Kaltura. Most of our work is done with Kaltura, and that fits very nicely with our content delivery network. Um, and then Keen.io for instrumentation. 
The thing that I'm not showing here is that by virtue of having this kind of cluster architecture, we can bring in a lot of other services, uh, optimization services, data services, whatever is needed for the tutorials can be integrated and the Docker containers can consume from those. So alongside of this, we have a Kubernetes cluster and then we also have our log uh, capture, log management um, in Kibana where, for instance, we're, we're instrumenting, as people are running code, we're watching if there's exceptions, uh, and we're gathering that out of, out of our logs. Um, ostensibly, we could use that for real-time services eventually to give feedback to people. If they, if they are running into problems with the code that they're writing, we might suggest some other material that they go study. So that's, that's kind of like a, well, actually, a, a four-layer uh, architecture then for where O'Reilly jumped into big data. And the big data part of this is that we have millions of people interacting through Safari, and we're capturing a lot of log files of their interactions. And uh, so one of the things that we've built up on top of this is a, uh, an API for, uh, based on React actually, uh, an API for formative assessment. So you can do live coding, but we can watch how you're doing the coding. And we have the log files. And now we're starting to build out with Kafka some more real-time streams to, to take advantage of that. Uh, hopefully uh, integrate that into our, uh, our content recommendations. Um, what this strikes to, I want to give a little bit of history. Uh, how many people have run across literate programming by Don Knuth? Anybody? OK, great. So uh, Don, I, I uh, was at a particular university where Don was teaching, and I was a grad student, and Doug Cutting was an undergrad, uh, all in the same department, way, way, way back when, many years ago. And uh, Don and I used to fight over the laser printers, which were new. Um, but he came up with this idea of literate programming. The paper that I first saw about it was in 1983. And, and go back and check this paper, because he, he describes something in 1983 that he called Web, W-E-B. And if you read it, it sounds suspiciously like HTML. Um, so that was years before we saw anything like World Wide Web, but uh, definitely check out some of the early origins of literate programming. Um, but he did publish a book about this, and the idea is instead of telling computers what to do, instead of going into intricate detail of our programs and writing more and more complicated programs, instead we should focus on telling other people what we want the computers to do, such that the programs are a byproduct. But we have the social context, getting back to what Doug was talking about earlier and also what Ted was talking about, we have the social context of other people understanding what we're trying to accomplish. And it's really that social side, like at Apache, that is so important. And so this is more than just having documentation in your code. This is where you actually have a narrative, a document, that's executable. And, uh, and some people picked up on that. Wolfram Research uh, did notebooks for Mathematica. They really set the bar. And arguably, Jupyter descends from this. I, I think in many ways, Jupyter you know, used some of these ideas. And it's still probably the best notebooks that are out there. But more recently, I would uh, point you toward a keynote this year at PyCon from Lorena Barba. She's at GW. And uh, I've got the, the video and the slides. Um, she went back to uh, talking about really some of the, the social theory of open source projects. And for this, uh, she's invoking something called speech acts. Uh, and that goes back to uh, Terry Winograd and Fernando Flores. Fernando Flores had been one of our instructors a long time ago. Um, and it's interesting, Winograd and Flores were back at Stanford uh, in that time period I was mentioning, back in the 80s. Um, they came up with something called groupware back then. And uh, if you don't know this, the background on this, it actually ties into Google. Um, some of the early ideas of groupware kind of seeped into the early parts of Google, you can, if you look back on it. Uh, Terry Winograd was also Larry Page's graduate advisor. So back when Google was still at Stanford, um, there was a lot of overlap here. Um, Lorena is digging into open source culture and structured collaboration as speech acts. Uh, and this really goes back to a lot of the early work from Fernando Flores. He was uh, in a project called CyberSyn back in the 70s. A anybody ever heard of CyberSyn? It was uh, Chile, back before the US invaded Chile. Um, it was uh, uh, Chile's 
uh, efforts to have a cybernetic economy, have a very planned, data-driven economy. Back in the early 70s, they had one small mainframe they could use. And uh, Flores was really the architect for that. Um, he was later, uh, be as a result, became a political prisoner. He was in prison for a number of years, and then Stanford and Berkeley got him out of prison and, and brought him up to Stanford. So there's some theory behind it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about a couple other things here. Uh, if you are working with Jupiter, we've been working with a lot of authors, and we've found some do's and don'ts. Uh, the main thing is that, you, know, you don't want to have a, a notebook be too large. You want it to be a unit of thought, kind of like a unit of work. And you definitely don't want to have a page of text and a line of code and then a page of text. You want to chunk the text and the code. Um, you also don't want to have a page of code. It's, it's better to break it down, have a few lines of code uh, that, it, that accomplish something, that have some kind of result that people can try and, and see uh, execute, um, and, and that helps to build a kind of narrative flow. Um, so we've been working with people like Lorena Barba, who's an expert in using uh, Jupiter in education. Um, and, and the point of this is repeatable science. So here we are working with big data tools and enabling data science teams to gather really amazing uh, insights out of data. Um, we want to have repeatable science, and more particularly, we want to have repeatable data science. Um, notebooks are a great way to get people out of the IDEs and instead producing narratives, producing documents that encapsulate the code, the data, and really the rationale of what they're doing, as well as explaining and showing the insights. So it's through, uh, we believe, that by using Jupiter in, in some new and interesting ways, that this is leading towards uh, much more repeatable data science in a, a team context. Um, now, as far as building things, this gets interesting with Mesos. Uh, we have a tool that's publicly available now. It's called LaunchBot. LaunchBot.io is where it's at. And the idea is if you have Docker on your laptop and you, you bring in LaunchBot, then it's a bridge between GitHub and Docker Hub. It's a place where you can take and build containers and also build notebook resources fitting in those containers and then be able to do your, your commits, your check-ins, uh, respectively, in, in Git and in Docker. Um, so it's, it's a way of, uh, if you haven't built Docker containers before, uh, that can be a very time-consuming and memory-consuming activity and a lot of command line use. And uh, it's not something that we want to have our authors worrying about. So we have this tool. This is also done by Andrew Otawan, who's our CTO. Once you have material in a container, then you can slide that over to uh, DCOS, run it on Mesos. That's our view. Uh, so effectively, we're containerizing content, publishing containers now, in, in lieu of publishing books. Um, that's where we think that things are headed, or at least one major direction for things to be headed. But it's a great way of being able to balance working on your laptop and then achieving scale. Um, and so that's about what I've got there. But I can, I can talk more uh, if you have any questions about how we're, uh, what our transformation is. Uh, I, I, will, I will add one anecdote. I was in an engineering meeting when we were first rolling out some of these ideas. And we had a lot of engineers who, you know, they they have this history of having been involved with one of the first e-commerce sites. O'Reilly was very, very early in e-commerce. And so they've had this tradition of e-commerce for many, many years. And uh, we were trying to talk about bringing in Kafka and bringing in Spark to do the analytics, bringing in Docker, bringing in Mesos, these different big data technologies. And the engineers were pushing back and saying, we don't know, and it would be too costly. How can we learn about these new technologies? And there was literally a, a book about Mesos on the shelf in the meeting room. And I, I pulled it off the shelf. I was like, I think I know a publisher. Um, and, and that just shows you that I mean, we are really talented engineers, but they're not used to big data. And, and they felt relatively threatened, even circa 2015, um, by introducing these new technologies. Um, but it, it's been a challenge, but we've been bringing them into it. And so that's part of the transformation with Safari and moving all the O'Reilly content in Safari is retooling all of that as one large 
uh, machine learning project in some ways, um, but certainly one heavily instrumented big data project. Um, and so I, I find that somewhat ironic that we're hosting these technology conferences, but we're, we're also having to do our own, be humbled and do our own uh, dog fooding. Anyway, with that, thank you very much. I appreciate it, and uh, I'd love to answer any questions. Definitely, I mean, there's nothing terribly sacred about the Jupyter aspect of it, other than the fact that it's plumbing. There are Jupyter notebooks, but our audience doesn't see them. We don't show them. We show the HTML. So uh, similarly, we've looked at things like JSBin. Like if, if, you were sh if you were teaching a course, for instance, on web development, you wouldn't probably use a notebook. You'd use something like... Uh, Oh, gosh, I'm blanking on it. But JSBin is one of the options. There's several of these where you could show, for instance, your HTML and your CSS and your, your JavaScript side by side and then show them being rendered. So that's an example of where this whole architectural pattern of Mesos and Docker and the middleware and then the last mile in HTML, we can just plug in something else. So you were talking about architectural landscapes. So. Okay. Perfect, perfect. Was that Mark Madsen's talk? Great, great, excellent. Um, really great talk. I love that. The second to the last slide, if you if you didn't if you all didn't see it, the second to the last slide was the one that just really got me about the adaptive patterns in lieu of static data warehouses. I thought that was a gem. Um, so yes, I mean you know uh, nothing's particularly sacred. This is this is the first toe in the water for us, but we do feel that this this kind of you know, again, having a Mesos cluster where we can do a lot of multi-tenancy and, and deploy a number of things on the same cluster, we feel that that's important. Having the Docker containers uh, basically provide a sandbox, but also provide everything you need for that use case, we feel that that's very important. Um, what, what gets stuck in there, whether it's Jupyter or something else like it that allows you to interact, it could be a VR plugin. We've looked at that as well. It could be a hardware simulator. That's another thing we've been talking about. So uh, yes, being able to work with some kind of um, architectural scenarios, um, like uh, Mark Richards does the katas for system architecture. I could see that being a very similar kind of thing. And in fact, Mark and I were talking about Richard, uh, 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 about that kind of use case. Um, so we, we're trying to experiment and, and also see if there are ways to just publish Docker through Safari or publish Jupyter through Safari or other things like it. Um, it. It's interesting when you get into other domains, when you're not programming, because we, we also publish about business, we publish about design, and in these other domains, the editors are just hammering us, you know, saying, well, how, why don't you make Jupyter fit this? And it's like, well, maybe it needs some other open source technology. Maybe something else would be closer to it. Um, and you know, I mean, my brother works in Hollywood and does animation and films, and it's quite transformative in terms of how we can deliver education in the future and, and in remote parts of the world. Suddenly, you're going to get a bigger pool of people. You know, and I think it could be. I mean, something that's not here is the chat side of it. When we're teaching online, we make heavy use of, of the social aspects and the interaction. People do group projects with other people they have never met. Um, and so putting a Slack plug in here, for instance, would be interesting. Um, you, have you seen Mural that Microsoft and IBM are working with? But it, basically having shared whiteboards across the internet and being able to have basically a plug in here, you can have the literal whiteboard, you can have your, your mobile devices, or you can have the, the laptop. Um, we've actually talked with Mural about doing some integration. So that would be more of kind of what you're talking about there. Well, um, one thing that struck me looking at this is 
Okay, so you've got an interface and you've got compute on the back end. And you're okay. using programming, which is just kind of talking to the native compute on the back end. But right. why is it just limited programming? You could have simulation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Virtually anything could be simulated. You know, I mean, economics, uh, air, airframe design, whatever. And you could have that interface on the front and yeah. the compute on the back end. I mean, between Unity and AutoCAD and, and the rest, I mean, there's all kinds of simulation engines. Universe now with deep learning on it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, one, thing I didn't, one thing I didn't bring up, so, you know, just to give you perspective, okay? So 20 years ago, this guy was doing chatbots, right? It was, one yeah. The first ones, you know? <laughs> and, and now you guys are just catching up to him. So in 20 years, you're going to be going, holy shit. You know? <laughs> I should have taken what he said a lot more seriously. Thank you, Kyle. Yeah. <laughs> Question, yeah. Well, definitely. So this doesn't completely replace books. I owned a bookstore for seven years, and I had performance art inside the bookstore, and I, I love that experience. As an author, the thing that I miss the most with online is that I don't get to do the book signings like Ellen and Ted were doing today. That's the thing that I love the most is meeting people and you know having the, the line. Um, so yeah, it, it, it begs a different experience. Um, so the thing about this was to really capture uh, a unit of thought. So human attention span is approximately 18 minutes. And we're guiding people to do video segments that are very short for us traditionally. We do six hour videos or 10 hour videos. These are typically 15 to 20 minutes. And so the idea is to capture somebody who really understands a topic like Ted talking about streaming or Doug talking about Apache Hadoop. Can we get them for the length of human attention span in one nugget? talk out loud about what they really think. Or, or for instance, Peter Norvig talking about AI. <laughs> you know, can we get them for 20 minutes to just share that with us? And oh, by the way, here's something we can interact with ourselves. Because that's a kind of trick of the mind to be able to learn. When you get that expert uh, uh, perspective, but then you also have the hands-on, then we find that people absorb the material much more. So this is just a, a, a nugget. Now, in terms of, of more substantial media, um, I, I think what the answer there ultimately is, pedagogically, uh, we see pathing. So uh, part of the, one of the teams that I lead, I hired a number of people, small number of people who had a shared experience. They had all been professors teaching in academia, uh, myself included. Um, they'd all been industry trainers, and they'd all been authors for some popular book or video. So they knew a range of how we were working, but they understood it in terms of pedagogy and instructional design and curriculum, whereas editors don't know that. Um, and one of the first things we've done is, is what we call pathing, um, to be able to take a chapter of a book here and a section of a video there and show a narrative through it and then bundle that, present that as almost like an online course. And we find that the, the stats on that are just through the roof. People really understand paths because it, it goes from a need to a goal. You progress. So I, I think that that's kind of the evolution, and that will involve books. I don't think books will go away. I really, really hope they don't. Um, and I would never want to try to help push that. Um, so, so this is just kind of the nugget, whereas I see the evolution of like media for education is more the pathing. Does that? The home? The, the other thing about path and getting back to big data is that we have it instrumented. So the new paths that are coming out, I think this will probably be January, um, they have uh, what we call formative assessment, uh, where you sort of learn while you're taking a test, and you get feedback. And so as you go through the path at different stages, here's a little quiz with randomly selected five questions about that topic, and it'll get feedback right away, but that goes into log files. So by the time that you're done with the path, we have a pretty good idea where you stand in this, and the content recommenders can then jump in um, through the real-time streams and say, oh, we think maybe you should try these other books first before you move ahead. I think that, that kind of real-time scenario of people interacting uh, with media, I think that's more likely. 
more questions? Yeah. How do you see the future for continent delivery, business model for continent delivery? It, Especially there's been books, and now it's Jupiter going forward. Well, you know, I mean, Jupiter, <clears throat> I, I, I see Jupiter as like, it displaces word docs. I see it as a better way of doing word docs. Or it displaces a Python script. Right, it's something that's richer. Um, but as far as delivery, um, you know, a lot of this has been very much web-based, uh, very much laptop or desktop-based. Um, the thing that we haven't cracked yet is something that's really good for mobile. Um, and, and part of that is how, how are you gonna go in and like change a code cell? And let me, let me get back to this. How are you gonna go back in and change um, a cell of code on a mobile device? Um, that's a hard UX problem. I mean, maybe we can zoom out, but are we able to do code editors on a mobile device or, or even on a tablet? Um, and I, we don't really have a good answer on that. Um, what we did, though, was we went to a school where people learn to be designers and developers at the same time. And so everybody getting a degree, they get a dual degree in software engineering and interactive design. And uh, it's out of Columbia. It's called ITS, and, uh, or, sorry, ITP. And, uh, and we worked with them, we really posed this problem to them, and they were really the main developers on this project. Um, but they're still thinking about it. They're still trying to figure out where that goes. And maybe it means that mobile devices change over time, too. Maybe AR becomes part of this. I, I really think, I have a lot of hopes that some type of augmented reality is, is solves some of that form factor of very small devices. You know, th and this strikes me, this is, you should be pitching this to the Singapore government. I mean, they would love, <laughs> love you know. to. Well, I, actually, uh, some of the folks from one of the universities came up, so we're, we may be talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, just the Singapore government, like, oh, students, they can learn everything, everywhere, all the time. <laughs> it's good. I'm, I'm down with that. <laughs> uh, do it on mobile? Oh, yeah, go bathroom. Okay, no problem. <laughs> uh, any, any other questions? I'm sorry. Yeah, question. Yeah, let me, let me, I actually, I thought for this audience that wouldn't be quite as, oh, come on, uh, quite as much. Um, let me dig back up here. Actually, let me play and then I can go backwards. So, there, do you know about Zenodo? Um, right here, it's down at the bottom. So, in academia, typically, uh, when you publish a paper to make it citable, there's something called a DOI, a, a digital object identifier. So, it's it's like a UUID for an academic work, and uh, or a URI is probably a better way to say it. Um, <clears throat> but a, a DOI is what you need to have assigned before you can really call it an academic citation. Um, so Zenodo is a service, they'll allow you to, uh, or they provide the way where you can get a DOI assigned to a GitHub repo. So you can check in uh, a notebook on a GitHub repo and then assign a DOI, and from that point it's, it's citable. And, and this is used in practice. Again, if you're familiar with, I, I'm, I, I'm not as familiar as I should be, um, uh, I was with Fernando Perez right after the Gravity Waves part got published. I was there like a couple days afterwards. He's a physicist by training. He's at L Lawrence Berkeley. And uh, they were just beside themselves because these other physicists had published about Gravity Waves using Jupyter Notebooks. And that's definitely citable. Does that, does that help? Anything else? All right. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, so one, one, one more thing uh, to wind it up. Uh, for some of you that came in a little bit later, uh, um, thanks. Um, <laughs> no, some, some of you that came in a little bit later, um, uh, Srivas, the, the uh, chief data architect for Uber, couldn't make it tonight. You know, again, apologies. But I did see his talk today at Strata. And let me summarize it for you. Um, you think writing your test cases are hard? Try writing a test case.